tell me, tell me when you began to listen to Christmas music. When, when, when is about that time? You, you know when it is for me? It's the first of November. Every year I start listening to Christmas music. I got a three or four hundred songs, Christmas songs. I start listening through my Christmas songs, and I love them. In fact, last year. I started in the middle of October because, I don't know, I just felt like I needed the infusion a little bit early last year. I love Christmas songs. Christian songs, Christian songs have as a characteristic of those songs to to teach the deep things about God, the deep things about His nature, about the actions of God about the purposes of God in our life. And we learn those through Christian songs, and then we offer those up to God as an expression of our worship to Him. That's why you should never never stand for shallow words. Shallow words are not worship. It is the deep truths of God that we offer back up. That's genuine worship to God. The first Christmas carol was not um, O Little Town of Bethlehem or uh, We Three Kings or Rudolph. The first Christmas carol ever sung was sung by Mary, the mother of Jesus, months before he was even born. And it's located in the book of Luke, and I want you to turn with me there. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46 to 55. This is the first Christmas carol, and a carol in which we understand so much about the depth of who God is. In Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46, I call it Mary's song, but the official word is uh, magnificat. And it is a word that is a Latin word that means magnify. Oh, my soul magnifies the Lord. And it's the beginning of Mary's song. Mary understood who she was carrying. She may have not understood all the depth of everything, but she understood who she was carrying. She knew that she was carrying the Son of the living God. She knew she was carrying the Messiah, and she was so excited. She was so overwhelmed with praise, it just burst out of her. And this is the expression of her praise that we have captured in this passage of Scripture. She teaches us how to approach God in authentic praise in this passage of Scripture. Oh, we should walk into this passage sort of taking our shoes off, we're on holy ground. As we really understand praise from the the heart and from the lips of Mary. Mary, as she explains praise or she expresses praise, demonstrates praise to us, shows us first of all, that worship happens by acknowledging with soul and spirit, with soul and spirit, the greatness of God in our life. Notice how she describes it in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The key word that I want you to grab hold of is the word magnify. The word magnify means to view with greater intensity. It means to esteem. It means to place something in higher importance in our life. As I was studying this passage, and quite honestly, I I had just never really done an in-depth study on the passage before in my life. And I thought, why have I not? And I wanted to go and see what Mary had to say about this worship of the Messiah. And as I thought about the word magnify, I thought about the word magnifying glass. I thought about that glass. What do you do with a magnifying glass? A magnifying glass takes something and gives it greater detail, demonstrates the detail that is there. It allows us to see with greater detail so that what we might have missed if we weren't careful now has become so apparent to us. That's why you use a magnifying glass. And when you use a magnifying glass, you, you don't glance at it, you gaze into it. 
When you use a magnifying glass, you, you intend to stay there a while and really look with intensity at what detail you're seeing. So here's Mary. And she says, I magnify the Lord with my soul. Mary pushed aside all the distractions the distractions of what is going on in my life, what is happening to me, what is going on. I have never even known a man. Now I am pregnant, out of wedlock. What's going to happen to me? What, what is my reputation going to be like? What are they going to say about me? What are they going to do to me? There were so many questions. Her life was all in turmoil, but you can't tell it from the song because she pushed away the distractions that took away the grandeur and the greatness and the glory of God, and she lifted him up, and she gazed upon the face of God. And as she gazed upon the face of God, she began to understand more clearly who he is and what he was doing in her life. When was the last time you did this? When was the last time you honestly and truthfully worshipped? I'm not saying when was the last time you sang. We just did that. But singing is not necessarily worship. It can be, but it's not necessarily, because I'm not saying, when did you sing last? When did you praise last? When was the last time you magnified the Lord? You lifted him up. You looked and gazed upon the face of God, and you saw who he really is. I'm not talking about someone with their hands folded, looking back and saying, you know, real men don't sing. Real, you know, real men don't sing, so I'm not going to sing. No, real men praise God. That's what real men do. Yeah. Real men praise God. It's not taking out your evaluation pad with a worship service. Well, okay, let's see how they did today. Uh, they sang one song I liked, at least. They did that. And why don't they ever sing my favorite song as though they were supposed to know what that is? And why don't they sing it the way I like it to be sung? But you see, worship was never intended to be satisfying you and me. Worship was intended to be focused toward Him. So it's not getting out the evaluation pad, how did they do today? It isn't to please us, it's to please Him. The whole idea of worship is to magnify the Lord. And the magnifying of the Lord is to begin in the soul. The soul is the mind, will, and the emotions. It is to begin with an understanding of truth and translate that truth into spirit because it's our spirit that connects with God. And this is why Mary says it this way. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. One day you and I are going to shed this body and we're going to be in just our spirit and we're going to be there in heaven and ushered in to the throne room of God and when we see Him, we will look at Him and say, wow, so that is what God is. And then when they usher us in again the second time, we'll say, oh, wow, so this is God. And when they usher us in for the one millionth time, we'll say, oh, wow, so this is God. But Jesus said in John chapter 4, my worshipers will be those who worship me in spirit and in truth. You can experience a taste of heaven here on earth. You don't have to wait. You can experience a taste of heaven here on earth through praise, through worship, 
through taking these truths about God, lifting him up, magnifying him, looking, gazing into his face and seeing who he really is. And even in this flesh and blood, you can say, oh, wow. So this is God. This is what praise was all about. This is what was intended to be from the very beginning. And Mary experiencing this whole sense of magnifying him says, I lift him up. I look into his face and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I want you to notice that last phrase she says, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Savior. Genuine worship of God flows from the truth about God from His Word that by faith we have embraced in our hearts, in our soul, and then allowed to be expressed by our spirit toward Him in praise. Mary understands a truth about herself that I'm afraid Some have forgotten about her today. Mary praises the Lord for being her Savior because Mary needed a Savior. Uh, There is is a teaching today called the Immaculate Conception, and the concept of Immaculate Conception cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. The idea of Immaculate Conception came from this issue How could a sinless Christ be born of a sinful woman? Well, apparently he couldn't, so we've got to make Mary sinless too. So Mary, this was the teaching that sort of emerged over time. We'll make Mary sinless, immaculate conception, so that now she can give birth to a sinless Christ. But here's the truth. The reason why a sinless Christ can be born in the body of a sinful person is because of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Because his father was not human, his father was God. Here is the truth about Mary. Mary was just an ordinary person. She was a sinful person, just like every other person is sinful. There's only been one sinless person who's ever lived, and that was Jesus Christ. And so Mary needed a Savior, just like we need a Savior. And Mary even expresses that truth. Uh, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. How was it that Mary came to be saved? The very same way you and I are saved. She trusted in Christ alone for her salvation. She committed her heart and life to Jesus Christ. To this one that she gave birth to, this one became her Savior as well. When God uh, saves us, He does not just save us for the hereafter. He does save us for the hereafter, but He also saves us for the here and now. So that God is our Savior in completion from this moment until forever. He becomes our Savior. Mary, as she's teaching us about worship, expresses this truth that we must grasp today. And that is simply this. Worship gives us the opportunity to push the world aside. And don't we need that? Aren't there times in our lives we need to push the world aside and all the problems and the struggles and the stresses and everything we're dealing with and all of the the questions that we have and things that we cannot put together. Isn't there a time we could push the world aside? It is the time of worship in which we push the world aside and we look upon the face of God and we see Him. And as we do, we remember His rescue in our lives. This is the first thing about worship Mary teaches us. Second of all, worship expresses thanksgiving to the Lord. That's what else she's doing in the passage. Notice what it says in Luke chapter 1, verses 48 to 53. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he he who is mighty has done great things for me. In your Bible, would you circle the word for? It's a key word. 
of understanding who Mary is. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. Mary expresses thanksgiving for four key things very quickly. First is this, she expresses gratitude for God's mercy. She says, I know who I am. I'm a handmaiden. I'm nobody. I, I, would, have, I would have not been known by anyone. I would have not done anything really in the world that was all that significant. I'm not some rich and famous person in this world. I'm a nobody. But God takes nobodies and he makes them somebodies when they're willing to trust him. And this is what happens to Mary. And Mary acknowledges that truth. And Mary then says, and you know what? For generation after generation, they will call me blessed. They will call me blessed. Not because of something that I've done, but because of what he did for me. They will call me blessed. And we do. 2,000 years later, here we are, and we look back at Mary and say, Mary, you are blessed. What a blessed woman you are. What a wonderful woman God did in you. What a wonderful thing he accomplished through you. Oh, Mary, we honor you and appreciate you for what God did in and through your life. You were willing to let God do it. Thank God for this. Can I tell you what God did in and through Mary? God can do in and through you. I'm not talking about the virgin birth, but I am talking about using someone, using you, that feels like a nobody to be a somebody, and God can use you in a great and powerful way, just like he used Mary. You say, how do you know that? Because later in Jesus' ministry, in Luke chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, a woman shouts out while he's preaching. Please don't do that this morning. A woman shouts out while he's preaching these words, blessed is the womb that bore you. That woman was talking about Mary. Blessed be the woman who brought you into the world. And Jesus shouted back to her, More than that, blessed are all these who hear the word of God and keep it. Why was Mary blessed? Not because of something inherent in her, but because of What God did through her, she had heard the word of God. And instead of cowering back, instead of running from what God had called her to do, she said, God, whatever you want, the answer is yes. God is coming to us today and he is saying, I want to use you. I want to bless you. I want to do something in your life, but it's going to take you trusting me. It's going to take you stepping out in faith. But if you're willing to hear my word, and obey what I tell you to do. I will use you in a way you did not know. You didn't understand. And it won't be you. It will be me in you. And that's true about every single one of us in this room. God can and will use us if we're willing to do it. It comes back to this. Get into his word and let his word get into you. It's not about what your talents are. It is what your trusting is. And if you're willing to trust him. If you're willing to obey him, he will use you. It is this one truth that should bring us to our knees in gratitude that if we will make much of him, he will make much of us. Second of all, Mary expresses gratitude for God's might in verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. This one truth ought to engender absolute loyalty to God. That whoever we are, whatever we have done, whatever we can accomplish is God's work, God's grace in us. I'm nothing without Him, but I am anything He wants me to be with Him. It is God in me. Mary expresses gratitude for God's sovereignty. 
Look at what she says in verses 51 to 53. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary's song is reminding us that there is a God in heaven. And he is on his throne and he is in charge. And the times in which we feel like the world is out of control, there is a God in control. And this God has said, if you are proud and arrogant, if you are rebellious against me, if you are self-willed against my will, if you stand against me, if all you care about is you, I will push you away. I will bring you down. Those of you who are haughty and in rebellion, but if you are humble in heart and you are obedient to me, I will lift you up. I will use you. I will give you a strength beyond yourself. This is a sovereign God who is in charge who says, do not let those who seem to be in charge fool you. I'm in charge. I'm on my throne. It may not be in the timetable that you want. It may not be the way you want God to demonstrate his sovereignty. But in due season, in God's timing, he will demonstrate the truth. This one truth should renew confidence in us that God is good, God is in control, and we can rest in him. Trust him. Yield yourself to him. He's the one in charge. And then Mary expresses gratitude finally for God's faithfulness. And notice what she says in verse 54 and 55. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He has spoken to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. What is she talking about? There was a day that God gave a message to Abraham. There is a descendant coming from you who will be the Son of God, who will be the promised one, who will be the Messiah, who will be God in flesh. This day is coming, Abraham. And then over and over, he reiterated that promise to the prophets, and Mary is saying the day has come. All of these promises that God gave to us, every Hebrew woman had always wanted to be the one who brought this one, this promised one, into the world. And Mary said, I can hardly believe it. It's me. In me is the Son of the living God. The incarnation of Jesus Christ demonstrates that God keeps his promises. Have you come to know this God? This God who loves you, this God who is in control, this God who is the sovereign God, this God who raises up the poor and puts down the proud. Have you come to know this God who sent his son Jesus Christ to pay the penalty on the cross for your sin? You can never get to heaven on your own. We can never get there no matter how good we are. We can only get there through this one that we've sung about, we've praised today, this one that Christmas is about, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Have you come to know this Jesus? If you haven't, you can right now.